<laughs> Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Discussion Group. The ambition for this program is to have a thoughtful conversation on a variety of subjects. Today's topic is the life of Noor Inayat Khan. Noor was a British secret agent that worked as a wireless radio operator during World War II in Nazi-occupied France. Shy, creative, and sensitive, she played the harp, wrote a children's book, and deeply connected to her faith, believed in nonviolence. However, when World War II broke out, she wanted to help in the fight against fascism and the oppression overtaking her world. Descended from Indian royalty on her father's side, she has sometimes been called the princess spy. She was an extraordinary individual, and she made the ultimate sacrifice, and today's program will be about her. So I'd like to welcome the panelists. Thank you guys for being here today. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. for having us. I have a first clip to sort of introduce who Noor was and also to introduce the SOE. The SOE was the Special Operations Executive. It was a British secret uh, organization uh, set up to conduct sabotage and espionage on the enemy. So I thought we could take a look at this first clip to sort of get us started, then come back and begin our conversation. Sound okay? Sounds, Sounds good. good. Let's take a look. In 1940, the Germans conquered France and most of Europe. The Second World War had begun. Two years before the Americans entered the war, Britain was on its own. Desperate, they struck back at the Germans in one of the few ways they could, by creating a secret organization, the Special Operations Executive, the SOE. The mission of SOE was not to gather intelligence. It wasn't an espionage outfit. It was, quote, to set Europe ablaze. It was to carry out sabotage, blow up trains, blow up boats, canals, railroads, to make contact with resistance groups in occupied Europe, which could then be supplied from Britain. In the early hours of June the 17th, 1943, an RAF plane secretly landed in Nazi-occupied France. On board was a princess from a titled Indian family. She was also a British spy. Young, beautiful, and codenamed Madeleine, her assignment was described as the principal and most dangerous post in France. Her skills as a wireless operator would provide a vital link between Paris and London. In a city controlled by the Nazis, her life expectancy was just six weeks. Noor Inayat Khan was an unlikely secret agent. In training, her instructors described her as clumsy, easily flustered, and pretty scared of weapons. But her conspicuous courage in extreme danger would earn her the George Cross, one of only three awarded to women in World War II. She saw that the Second World War presented an existential challenge. It became the overriding moment of truth. She faced the greatest evil in all of human history. Could she survive? Okay. Um, so, I gotta admit, I had not heard of Noor uh, before. One night, several years ago, I just happened upon a uh, documentary on PBS, and then I was intrigued, and I, I started uh, reading into who she was, and I was like, why haven't I heard of her before? You know, I felt like she, maybe she was forgotten. Have, did you hear about her before? Absolutely not. Yeah? No, yeah. No, this is the first time. Right. It's a great story. It is, it's an amazing story. How about you? Had you? First time. Right. First time as well. Yeah. And I mean, surprising with, uh, with her story being so amazing. Yeah. I'm surprised that in schools or just really anywhere that yeah. no one really uh, seems to know either who she is or too much about her unless you dig into it a little bit more. Right. I mean, maybe in Britain and certainly mm -hmm. in India, she's probably very well known. But right. I think in the United States. And, you know, there was something very interesting in the beginning of that clip. And I think a lot of Americans tend to forget. For the United States, oh, well, the war started December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. But Britain was sort of on its own since 1939. 
you know, when the war began, they were fighting this. France was occupied and Britain stood alone. I, they, were, they were hoping the Americans would right. get into the war and exactly. I think Roosevelt was slowly working. I think we were on a pacifist setting, a pacifist setting because of World War I, we had enough. Right. So meanwhile, Britain was doing everything it could. So it set up uh, the SOE and things like that to do whatever it could. Yeah. But um, yeah, and so Noor, you know, we, we all watched the documentary uh, before the program. We, we, we watched a documentary on her. She seems like the most unlikely candidate to be a, a secret agent. But then sometimes you would it's think that might make the best then because yeah. who would assume Absolutely. this unlikely girl would become this amazing spy? She kind of like, yeah. is like under the radar, under the radar, so maybe that's what made her so good at it. I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, her, she comes from a background, her father was a huge influence in her life and we'll learn more about right. him in a moment. Exactly. But those values that she learned growing up, maybe that's what made her mm -hmm. a better uh, person at this um, because she, she took it very wholeheartedly of what she was doing. Well, the inner strength that it takes yeah. is enormous and it has to be bigger than yourself and you have to believe so deeply that you feel that you're invincible mm -hmm. and that's how she felt and it's amazing that's you know where she put her energy into which I'm sure did a lot of um, good and help especially in France I think people I mean we all know all the atrocities that happened to the Jews, but you know, France was occupied for a while. People, a lot, many people were murdered over there, and it was pretty terrible. There's lots of stories uh, that we don't know about from that perspective as well. Right, uh, it was it was a very dark time, and and maybe that was, you know, I know she comes from a pacifist setting. We'll we'll see a video clip on her background, uh, but she saw the darkness and, and knew something had to be done, mm -hmm. uh, whatever she could do to, to contribute. Um, all right, we'll, we'll watch clip number two. This next clip goes into her uh, childhood and growing up and her background with her family. And I think it sets the stage for what kind of person that we were just talking about that she would become. Let's take a look. Descended from Indian royalty, the overriding influence throughout her life with the teachings of her pacifist Sufi father. Noor was born in the shadows of the Kremlin in January 1914, where her father, a Sufi mystic, was teaching at the imperial court. Her mother, Aura Ray Baker, was an American who had fled her own family to marry Noor's father. They named her Noor Unisa, meaning light among women and she would become the light of her father's heart. She was, from the very start, as a young child, she was very generous and self-sacrificing. And she was always um, concerned more about others than about herself. When Noor was eight, the family moved to Paris, into a house given to them by a wealthy devotee of her father. It was called Fasel Mamsel, the House of Blessings. Well, I grew up in this house. And it was very obvious that it was a family home on the one side. Even in the days of uh, Noor's childhood here with her parents, it was a family home, but at the same time, it was a place for her father to receive his followers, uh, to give talks, to give classes, to hold meetings. One of Hazrat's students from the Netherlands painted a series of watercolors depicting life at Noor's home. Surrounded by her father's students from all over Europe, Noor felt deeply part of the larger whole, regardless of skin color, religion, or nationality. Primarily it was a path of service, service to the poor, service to those in need, and a call to remember God. Even as a child, Noor was drawn to this path of service, one she would follow as she grew up. Harsh reality was to intrude on Noor's idyllic childhood when ill health led to her father's death when she was just 13. So his loss, his, his absence, um, 
was an extraordinary loss. It was like this brilliant sun had been shining over everything and then suddenly departed. When Nora's father died, she was very young. She was a young teenager at the time and took on a, a role of mothering her siblings because her mother had fallen into a state of deep depression which lasted for years. Nor was academically gifted, writing poetry and stories, and she would later study child psychology at the Sorbonne. But Nor's real passion was music, the harp being her favorite instrument. Nor also wrote for children, her stories appearing in the Paris newspapers and on French radio. By the age of 25, her book, Twenty Jataka Tales, had been published in France, Britain, and America. But Noor's pursuit of artistic endeavors was about to be brought to an abrupt halt. Okay. Um, so she had a very cultural uh, oh childhood background. Mm -hmm. um, you could tell that that helped shape her. You know, in the video they were talking about um, her father was Sufi, which Sufism is a form of Islamic mysticism that emphasizes introspection and spiritual closeness with God. And uh, I think that one of the nephews was saying uh, the father taught mostly a path to service, service to the poor, service to helping those in need. Mm -hmm. And you can see how this was, would later affect Nora when she would go and, and she would uh, agree to be in the uh, SOE and go under under cover of darkness mm -hmm. into France. Um, what do you think about her childhood um, when you saw it? Did you, she, she seems like a very creative, sensitive person. Absolutely. Um, just um, what a way to grow up around right. so many different people. I think you, you just, just from that alone, to learn um, acceptance of pretty much everyone, um, and especially of people who society says is beneath you and is down here to be around that yeah. was surrounded with such a positive outlook and such love for it as opposed to um, you know distrust and distaste against it um, right I think is enlightening in itself and um, so. I had to have a powerful I mean we're all shaped by the things that happen to us when we grow up and what's around us. I mean, that's why it's so important when to, to expose your kids to different cultural things, even today, you know, yep. make sure, take them to see an orchestra, yeah. take them to, because uh, whether we know it or not, these little things start to make an impact. Um, and in Nora's case, I mean, she wrote a children's book, and I actually have it, um, 20 Jataka Tales. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a lovely book. Is there's really? lovely stories. Uh, there's stories uh, with, uh, about sacrifice, again, about nobility, about, uh, you know, there's talking animals and so forth. And they, they, they come from uh, old Buddhist stories. Mm, I was just going to say, yeah. very closely related. They're lovely stories. And you can kind of, you get a sense of what kind of person she was. Um, what were your thoughts? But I think it's, you know, even from watching some of the pictures that you see of her, it almost like seems she has a very shy sense to her, a very um, kind of lighthearted, childish sense to her, but still very giving. And I mean, maybe from the family that she's brought up in, and if they're helping other people and they're taking their own experiences and they want to bring that to other people. Um, maybe even by writing her book, if it's more or less some of her own experiences, yeah. but making them into child stories so it's more easy for others or young people to understand. Um, it's almost like she's teaching or following in a way that her dad was. You know, if he was a teacher, she's somewhat teaching. Right. And it's just kind of passing on that legacy. So, but yeah, yeah. she. I mean, as far as the, the, the concept, even how the family became, I mean, I think at that time, I mean, if he was from Indian royalty and, and her mother was... American. And was an American right. and had to leave her own family just so she could marry him. Right. Um, they're kind of starting yeah. this whole new sense. So it was pretty amazing, I think, right from the beginning. Absolutely, yeah. I, I can't imagine being so strongly connected to that and then her father passes away uh, from my reading he 
went on a trip to India and he became ill and he passed away. That must have been just devastating. Um, but then she, again, she stepped mm -hmm. into, her mother was depressed, taking care of her siblings, the household uh, chores and so forth. Mm -hmm. You start to see again that she steps into something. Yep. This, right. this sort of shy, creative girl, um, she rises to the occasion. Right, and did it on her own. It's not like anybody yeah. made her take that position. Yeah. It almost seemed like she stepped up and just right. kind of took on that role a little bit, maybe because she felt that's where she needed to be. That's what she needed to do. She had an inner, yep. an inner yep. um, sense of self and knew that you know, that was always underneath there. And right. it just needed an opening. Well, the next clip shows that well, things, things turn darker. Uh, the war begins, and we can take a look at how Nora and her family had to flee France. And then when they got to Britain, which is what happens, um, she decides with her brother that we need to be of service. Um, so we'll, that'll be our next clip. Let's take a look. On May the 10th, 1940, German troops invaded the Low Countries and swept into France. Like millions of others across Europe, Noor's life was to change irrevocably. On June the 14th, the invading German army reached Paris. Along with thousands of other refugees, the family struggled west via Tours, eventually reaching Bordeaux. Noor and the rest of the family managed to get on board the last boat of British refugees. And on the morning of June the 22nd, their ship docked at the Cornish port of Falmouth. Having reached the relative safety of England, Noor and her younger brother, Vilayat, decided to join the British fight against the Nazis. Vilayat joined the Royal Navy, working on minesweepers, while Noor joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the WAF to be trained as a wireless operator, choosing the name Nora Baker to better fit into her new British life. Two years later, in 1942, Nora, now a leading aircraftswoman, was approached and invited for an interview. It came from this building in Baker Street, the headquarters of SOE. The Morse code skills that she had learnt in the Air Force made her the ideal candidate for a wireless operator. She would send encrypted messages back to London. This was the most dangerous role in SOE, with a life expectancy of just six weeks. On the 29th of February, 1943, Noor embarked on three months of intensive training as a secret agent. She was taught how to survive in enemy territory, how to use weapons and explosives, and how to resist interrogation and torture. Surviving War Office documents describe Noor as emotional and imaginative. Her superiors remarked on her selfless dedication. The motive for her accepting the present task is apparently idealism. Noor's instructors saw this uncommon idealism as a distraction. But her skill on the radio was unquestioned. SOE radio operators were desperately needed in France. While Noor excelled at operating the radio, she often lost focus when coding and uncoding the wireless messages. The head of SOE France was Maurice Buckmaster. He needed every radio operator available. Get me Marx. Leo Marx was the head of communications at SOE, the chief cryptologist and a genius of codes and secret messages. I want you to look into the background of this trainee. For Buckmaster, Marx was Noor's last best hope. For some reason, Noor struggled with her coding, and Marx would have to find out why. I've read in your evaluations that you refuse to lie. That's very noble. It was my father's greatest lesson. But when you fail to encode a message correctly, you have lied. <laughs> what? When you fail to encode a message correctly, people will die. The message will not get through. You must tell the truth. This provided the focus she needed, the grounding in the real challenges she would face. Marx watched as her technique began to improve. Each time Noor finished encoding a line, she closed her eyes and ran her finger over the phrase, as if saying a prayer, tapping into a resource no other agent had. And when she was done, her work 
was perfect. There was one final task. Marks must give Noah a bluff check, a secret signal by which they would know that she had been captured and that the Germans, not Noah, were using her radio. All you need to do is remember to never use a key phrase with 18 letters in it. Any other number, but not 18. Once in Paris, she would adopt an entirely new identity, that of a French children's nurse named Jeanne-Marie Renier. But to London, Noor would be known by her code name, Madeleine, radio operator for the Prosper Network, the largest and most important SOE group in France. Okay. Well, that's quite a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it is something I, I, I found in my reading. Uh, Noor had said that um, when during the war and the Nazi tyranny, she said, I wish some Indians, because she came from Indian heritage on her father's side, I wish some Indians would win high military distinction in this war. If one or two could do something in the Allied service, which was very brave and in which everybody admired, it would help to make a bridge between the English people and the Indians. Little did Nor know she would become one of those right. people. It just yes. opens up so many thoughts when you watch that particular clip for two reasons. One, because of six weeks. Right. Like who would sign up for that right. knowing that you probably will not survive more than six weeks. Right. And then also, um, like we were discussing a little bit, I think it was more so my surprise that um, during that time, I'm not surprised that there were women that were involved in the military, but I didn't think they were being used such as so what they were training her for as, right. as spies. Um, right. For some reason, I just thought it was more of a man's war and if they were turning someone into spies or training right. people to do things like that, it was mostly men. So we're kind of seeing a whole different side that someone like myself, I didn't know right. that. I mean, it was... Or you see the American side, which the women in the war were nurses. Yes. They were all right. yep. mostly yep. nurses. And um, that, But that's, again, that's, that's what we see. Yep. We don't see their side and their perspective or anyone else's except right. ours and who we're fighting against as opposed to who were our allies and we, who we were helping. And I think in some of my reading, it was easier for a woman to sort of blend in in mm -hmm. occupied mm -hmm. France at the time because they weren't suspected. Yep. Uh, and it was that very key thing. But I remember she was nonviolent. And in my reading, you know, she still had that sort of pacifist, you know, she was someone deeply affected by Gandhi. Right. And, uh, she had that pacifist setting, so she didn't. She was. She didn't like weapons. Yep. So this was the one thing she could do, right. radio operator, that wouldn't physically hurt someone yep. else, but she can contribute. So, unfortunately, it was also the most dangerous. Yep. Yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, we saw where she had trouble with her coding, right. and uh, because it was interesting the way Leo Marx, who mm -hmm. was the this brilliant code expert sort of read about her and how to how to get her where she needed to be right. to go that whole part about well if you get the code wrong you in fact you are lying which is very interesting which obviously very works sneaky as far as to like kind of yeah. i think in a way because i mean it, it, she's not lying she is if she doesn't get it right she doesn't get it right right but he knew like how to put it in sense like reading about her life and her background yeah. how he Motivate could word her. it that she might get it in a different right. perspective and then be able to nail it and yeah. then i don't know if it's sneaky i guess sneaky not is in a bad way like, like i knew he was, how he was to trying reach to her. get yes right. yeah. he was he was trying to, to get something how to motivate yep yeah how to, how to get her right. to where she needed to be, which for, I mean, I was pretty smart, right? Like, yeah. go for what she really believes in, which she is a pacifist. It doesn't ever want to hurt anything or anybody. <laughs> and you're like, well, uh, you're kind of killing people if you get it wrong. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> She's probably Just like, a little pressure right. at home. And I'm just like, <laughs> like, you know, all over it and going crazy. I'm going to get it right. And then you can't tell, like, she couldn't tell her mother. They were all living in London at the time. She couldn't tell her mother that she was doing something like this. Right. Um, she sort of just told her, I'm going off to do yeah. other things. That must have been very difficult. 
to hold um, that all in and be yeah. the only one that knows that in your family and kind of branch off from where everybody else is and basically be on your own almost. I mean, that's got to be extremely difficult, yeah, especially with what she was doing. So, right. I mean, that's got to be really difficult. You know, you watch this. Would you be able to do what she was going to do? What do you think? I would probably have to say no. In all honesty, I, I yeah. mean, not that I'm not a helpful person, but I mean, like, knowing, you know what I'm saying, like how dangerous that is and the position that you're putting yourself in, in all honesty, I would probably have to say no. I don't, yeah. I don't think I would be able to do what she did. I mean, that comes from a, an amazing strength that I don't right. think everybody has. I and agree. you can be a wonderful person, but to have that kind of strength to just go and do that, not, not everybody has that gift. I mean, you, that, I you think would contribute, but in a different capacity. I probably, yeah. I mean, certainly. Yeah. But I mean, I just think that's what made her amazing was just that she just had this. Right about her that most people just don't and yeah. I think that's what made her great the courage what about you would you have been able to I don't think I could have but well I mean but how's the question posed is it you know am I her did I grow up am I born into this it's, was that my growing up was that my upbringing yeah. like if if it was and I'd probably you know I'd have to say maybe like why why not if that's if, if I'm, if we're talking about, if you're, like, that, yeah. if you're saying, if that were you, right. you know, then, you know, but if like, you know, that was me growing up in America, the way I grew up, like, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it, it's a I different, think it's a different you're right, it's a totally different, even during the war, we had our like cold war drills where you'd hide under your desk, but our perspective was absolutely not seeing people dragged into the streets and shot. Like we, you know, that we didn't live any of that. Like, Correct. so the perspective is completely different. Like I had no sense of, um, I was never scared for my life growing up. Like these, this is what these people saw. Yeah. And I think that brings out a totally different sense of um, self. And, it's a whole different level. And yeah. moral value and, and how you're offended by it and how you do anything to make it stop. Um, just different. It takes great integrity to yeah. to act when the situation calls for right. it. I'd like to say yes. I'd like to say if I were growing up in that environment and I would had that opportunity, I'd love to, you know, have that courage and will to do that. But you know, <laughs> it's it would still be something very deeply you'd have right. to think about ahead Abs of time. Absolutely. Well, she's on her way. Preparing to go to France, uh, the next clip picks up uh, when she arrives in France. Let's take a look. On the night of the 16th of June, 1943, along with fellow SOE agent Diana Rowden, Noor was secretly flown from Tangmere in Sussex to an isolated field in the Loire Valley. She was already in extreme danger. She arrived eventually, our Lysander, not knowing that the man who organized the Lysander operations was a double agent. The double agent who met her aircraft was Henri Derricourt. His actions would have devastating effects on the SOE network in France. He didn't betray Noir, but he didn't take any particular steps to make sure that she was all right. She used such sense as she had to make sure that she wasn't tracked and got away, apparently untraced to Paris. Three years after she had fled the city, Noor found herself back in a Paris now dominated by the German military. Her mission was to join a secret SOE network called Prosper, where she would work as a wireless operator for locally recruited agent Henri Gary. Within days of her arrival, Noor secretly began to transmit vital information back to London. To avoid detection, she was constantly on the move. Hidden in her suitcase, her radio went everywhere with her. In Paris, within a week of Noor arriving, the double agent Derricourt's treachery had led the Gestapo to arrest almost the entire Prosper network. 
Nor was now one of the last wireless operators still operating in the city. Head of SOE's French section, Maurice Buckmaster, offered Nor a route to safety on one of their flights out of France. Realizing her significance, Nor refused. Buckmaster left her out there because she was the only radio link with London after the collapse of the circuit. He needed Nor. She became very, very important to him. But Baker Street weren't the only people listening for Nor's transmissions. With the arrest of the other SOE wireless operators, the Germans could concentrate all their efforts on the one wireless still transmitting from Paris. She then ran around Paris while the Gestapo was swooping on every other single member of the circuit for a good two months without being caught. It would appear that she survived through a mixture of luck and sheer cunning and quick-wittedness. For all her time in Paris, Noor had never returned to her childhood home. But now, exhausted and alone, she returned to Suren, her old neighborhood, calling upon a family friend. It was a desperate and dangerous choice. Agents were trained not to go anywhere near people who might know who they were, really were, uh, because it was felt that that could be very dangerous and draw attention to them. Noor's new life met her old, as she strung her radio antenna in a place so close to her family home. Maybe it was just a, a way of gaining some kind of inner strength to just see the place where her father and her mother had lived, where she had grown up and known maybe happier times. Weeks passed and Noor grew accustomed to exhaustion, as she and her radio were always on the move. And then the constant threat, the realization that every time your finger hits that, that key, it's not just the people in England who are hearing it, it's Germans too, and they're just, they're just trying to find you, and eventually they will. Noor had now been transmitting for more than 12 weeks over twice the six-week life expectancy of a wireless operator. Against all odds, she continued to evade the Gestapo, but was on borrowed time. All right. Oof. <laughs> what, uh, what do you think? Gosh, walking around Paris, that must have been just... You had to be on guard all the time. Especially knowing you're the last, like anxiety, you're the last yeah. in the area, and yeah. you know everyone's basically relying on up. you, and yeah. <laughs> you're on what they're yeah. saying borrowed time now. Uh, that's that's got to be quite a thing, <laughs> yeah, right? Um, and your life is in a suitcase. Pressure. You know your you know your equipment, everything. It's like you everywhere you go. You can be stopped at any moment. Because those things are heavy. Yeah, yeah, we had seen, there was a, um, when right. we were watching it, they were showing, um, there was a man like that was trying to like pick it up instead of oh, how heavy And you had to pretend that this was... Yep, and just, I mean, yeah. they were saying she's a small woman, she's Jeez. petite, and now she's got to carry this heavy equipment around with her all over the place from site to site to site to site and not look like she's struggling. Right. Yeah. Maurice Buckmaster, officer, away home. Okay, this has gotten too dangerous. Does she come home? No, again, she sort of steps up. Yeah. And um, when she went back to her childhood home, um, why do you think she went back? Do you think it was to sort of kind of get a little strength in seeing it? I would think so. I mean, that's uh, her home was like a temple, basically. Her father made it like um, a sanctuary. So uh, maybe she just needed to something smell the air around there even you know i think that's extremely depressing to have to look out the window and you see, see that flag yeah I mean, the the swastika, you <laughs> yeah where you grew up and against you, everything that that house was yeah. about i mean but I, it might fuel you as mm -hmm. well you know f like burn that flame of interesting of resistance and you know to keep going that you're doing you are doing the right thing and you know I think about her hitting that key and how long it's going to take them to find her. And they were looking for her. They, you know, the reading I did, they were looking for her. They, she had a couple of instances where she was quite clever and she talked her way out of, um, right. I think we saw one where someone caught her 
one of the soldiers caught her stringing up. Right. Because they had to string up a, a wire. Mm -hmm. I forget how long it had to be. It was 50 it? feet, I think. Something like that. Yeah. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah. This is a circle. <laughs> just keep going around and around. <laughs> But that, I mean, still, just to think that, and like you said, like every time she's hitting that button, to know that every time she hits it, they are, they they're are listening. looking for her. They yes. are listening for her. They are looking for her. So every time she's doing what she set out to do, that's now bringing them possibly even closer to her location. Right. So the amount of pressure that must put, or the scare and everything else, just knowing that you have no idea how close they might be. They could be, you know, far. They could be around the corner. Like, you don't know. Like, you just... You don't know. You can't trust anybody. It. Exactly. Exactly. But that's got to be scary. You're like, mm -hmm. you know, she's doing what she's set out to do, but still... Like, and by yourself. They're and not, you know, yourself. Britain's not the only one listening. You have everyone else that's trying to find you as well, so... Yeah. And you can't get a sense of place either, I know... Like a home is very important. Like, you know, we all have bad days and we all sort of have stress, but you go home mm -hmm. and you can sort of... Mm -hmm. She had to keep moving. So she can't even call this place that she's the safe house a home because the next day or two days later, she's got to move on. That's a difficult life. And again, you're probably so focused that... Right. Um, you don't think about it. Yeah. No. It's just your life. And you're, you've accepted it, you know. Very courageous. We have the next clip that, um, well, we'll find out that Schnorr didn't get caught because of the Germans and were searching for her. Um, well, we'll take a look. It's not, it's not a happy picture, but uh, let's take a look at this next clip that goes into what happened next. The bitter irony of her eventual capture was that it was an act of betrayal rather than the diligence of the German forces. As the resistance became uh, more organized and the Germans were getting more aware that um, this was going on, uh, they started to offer money for people to denounce people. Yeah. Noor was actually betrayed um, by a woman called Rene Gary, who was the sister of uh, the man who ran the organization, the circuit that she belonged to. There would appear to be a sense of kind of jealousy and resentment. Noor was a um, very glamorous, uh, attractive woman. René Gary was paid 100,000 French francs. The Gestapo would have paid considerably more for this information. The informant identified Noor's last secure apartment. <laughs> On October 13th, 1943, after working in Paris as an SOE agent for four months, Noor Inayat Khan was arrested. The Gestapo chief at Avenue Foch was a very plausible character who was called the Hans Kiefer, who knew how to win round the male agents. And he, he won their confidence and he put them at their ease and then he got them to talk. Noor never fell for that. Two weeks later, SOE once again began to pick up signals from Noor's transmitter. The message indicated that she was having problems. But observers back at the receiving station noted something odd. On this signal, Noor's all-important bluff security check was omitted. In fact, it was the Germans who were using Noor's captured radio to send fake messages to SOE in the hope that London would impart important information in their replies. But in captivity, Noor was now exasperating her captors and revealing nothing under interrogation. In a sworn statement after the war, Hans Kiefer, head of the Gestapo, said, Madeline, after her capture, showed great courage and we got no information whatsoever out of her. Noor had made an escape attempt from her cells here, onto the roof of 84 Avenue Foch. Kiefer had had enough, and at the end of November 1943, after threatening to shoot her, he ordered her removal from Paris. Noor was sent by train to Fortsheim Prison in Germany. But more disturbing was the evidence that Noor had been tortured. 
Her hands and feet were chained. I could hear the blows she received. She suffered much. Finally, after almost a year in captivity, Noah was taken to Dachau, the concentration camp where thousands of Jews, political prisoners, and others considered an enemy of the Reich. So she, of course, feared death. Every human being fears death, and no doubt she feared more than death the horrors of, of, of the brutality of the Gestapo. She came face to face with the very worst of reality, the worst of the world in which we live. How did she, how did she survive? How did she make her way through? It speaks of a level of faith, of resilience, of trust in the divine beneficence. The only word she said before Rupert shot her from behind was liberty. Her message was that the human soul is of the divine source, that every human being is sacrosanct, that all people must be free, and that if it requires the sacrifice of one's own life, then that commonwealth of humanity deserves such a sacrifice. first watched the first documentary that I saw on this I didn't know that she didn't make it and I kept watching thinking well maybe you know maybe at the end we'll see her as an old lady and she's talking about it. and you I kind of knew and you probably did too you kind of knew that this is not gonna go well um, I kind of got the same feeling that when I first read the diary of Anne Frank uh, you just you replay it and you're like you hope for a different ending when you go back to the material. You're like, you know it's not going to change, yeah. but it's yeah. just, you're you so touched by these people. You just wish that it could, so. Right. Um, anyway. It's sad. It is sad. She did very well. I, uh, she was betrayed. Um, right. Again, she, she stayed ahead of the Nazis. Um, she was betrayed for money. And even through that, still, it's, I think what kind of gives you chills a little bit is when they said how long she was in captivity yeah. and how, you know, she was abused and they're trying to get all this information and she gave nothing. Mm -hmm. Like, a year's time yeah. is a long time. And, they got zero. and to be chained and whatever else and still give nothing. Right. No information at all. I mean, that, <laughs> to not be broken down in even half that time and still not say anything. Yeah. I mean, that's strength above anything that I can even comprehend. Which is interesting because in her training, her trainers thought that was the one part that she did not do well on um, one of the documentaries was that when they did sort of faux interrogations during her training, she did terrible. Mm. Um, and they were like, well, we can't, this is not gonna work. And in the end, that turns out to be the one thing and I think it comes back to that inner strength. She found it, she had it, yeah. and she, she gave him nothing. Um, that's just an, uh, extraordinary. Well, she was able to hold on to that. And I think we saw in one of the documentaries, uh, some of the other captured Prosper Network people, they did talk. Yeah, um, and even before torture. Right. Right yeah. in the room when they got captured, mm -hmm. they were like right in the room and they, I think there was, there was some conversation as far as if you, give up names, we won't, no one will be her. Or right. there was like all these you kind of trust me. promises right. and they kind of wrote it down and gave it up right away. And so, yeah. Yeah. We're just soldiers. I remember yep. that was one of the things he would, yeah, that didn't work on Nor. No, no. It had to be very frustrating for them because it works on everyone else. But then you get this woman. This tiny little woman. 
And you can, that's not going to work. Those techniques... I mean, we see what an amazing person she is, but I just think it just kind of opens up that there's probably a lot of amazing people that we probably don't know of and right. that maybe we need to dig into a little bit and do a little bit more research because, like I said, I had never heard of her prior to this. Right. And now after watching this, it's, it's amazing. Right. Like, it's absolutely amazing what one person did with just courage and just, you know, moved on and... You know, I'm just what people are capable of. It's it's really enlightening and it's really amazing. Yeah, I agree too. I think it's great. It's in the on PBS and it's out there mm -hmm. a little more in the mainstream because you know I think that is important. We need more um, female role models as well as um, female role models that aren't um, white female role models. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That are people of color and different backgrounds that are role models for everybody and just like she wanted, you know, us to be able to see that to, you know, have that relationship built. Yep. Um, I think that when I first saw it, I was, I was like saddened that I had never heard this story before and um, I think it's great that it's out there and it should be, you know, out there a little more. Well, thank you both for being on today's program. Thank I appreciate you. Thank you. It. And thank you for watching. Uh, please join us next time, and we hope our guest will be singer Rick Astley. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>